I personally haven't said anything about Chapter 23 yet. Roger Purvis, who lectured while I was gone, uh, did a little bit of Chapter 23. Um, just like starting out what the sort of, I don't know, main idea of Chapter 23 is. And I thought I'd spend just like a quick few minutes reviewing what I think he did and also uh, do an example to sort of get you thinking about the idea of what's in Chapter 23. And then I'll continue, finish Chapter 23, and uh, do a little bit of Chapter 26. OK. Um, OK, so Chapter 23 is about um, the accuracy of averages. OK, so what we've done up to Chapter 23 is deal with sums of draws from a box and the percentage of ones in draws from a box. So what Chapter 23 does is it looks at the average of the draws from the box. So what's the average? The average is what you get if you add up all the numbers and divide by how many there are, right? So it's closely related to a sum of draws, right? So it's sum of draws divided by how many draws there are. So a lot of the same things that are true for sums of draws are also going to be true for averages. Um, and I'll give you uh, the formulas that I think Roger Purvis uh, already gave you. Um, which are these? So, so um, actually, I'll write down sums of draws first. So, expected value for the sum of draws is equal to the number of draws times the average of the box. SE for the sum of draws is equal to the square root of the number of draws times the average of the box. Okay, so that's, we already know those. And we also know that, well, how do you calculate the average? You calculate the average by taking the sum divided by how many draws there are. So whenever I say average of draws, that's the calculation that I have in mind, that I'm taking the sum of all the draws and dividing by how many draws there are. Well, it turns out that um, to get the expected value for the average and the standard error for the average, all you have to do is divide by the number of draws. Take these formulas, divide by the number of draws. Yeah, question? Is this the SD, um, of the I'm sorry, SD, SD of the box, absolutely. Thank you. Right. The SD for the sum of the draws is the square root of the number of draws times the SD of the box. Thank you. Um, OK, so um, the average is equal to the sum divided by the number of draws. And the formula for the expected value and the formula for the standard error, you can get just by dividing these formulas by the number of draws. So for expected value for the average of the draws, we take this, divide by the number of draws, and we simply get the average of the box. And intuitively, I think that makes sense. I'll, I'll talk a little bit through an example about you know, why that should be true. But if you're, if you're going to draw tickets from a box and take the average of your draws, well, the average of your, all your draws should be somewhere around the average of the box, just roughly intuitively. Um, and then what about the standard error? The standard error for the average, the way the book does this, and um, the way I think Roger Purvis did this, is just to say that, you know, this is literally SE sum divided by the number of draws. And that's what I'll, what I'll do is in this class, I'll, I'll just, uh, in lecture, I'll just calculate the SE sum and then divide it by the number of draws, OK? And then again, that, that comes from the, just the idea that the average is equal to the sum divided by the number of draws. So you can ignore the, word, the, the SE there, and it's just true. Average is equal to the sum divided by the number of draws. So um, if you want, you can plug in and do a little bit of calculation. So this, like I said, this is what I'll do. But just to show you, um, what is SE sum? SE sum is this, square root of number of draws times SD of box. And if we go ahead and divide that by number of draws, well, we get partial cancellation there. So we get SD of box on top. divided by the square root of the number of draws on the bottom. So if you want, you can use that formula. 
uh, you can jump directly from calculating the SD of the box, divide that by the square root of the number of draws, and that'll give you the SE average. What I will do is, is do this intermediate step of calculating SE sum, and then divide by number of draws. Um, I don't care which way you do it. I think you should pick one and, and always do it that way. Um, the, I often, you know, sometimes it will happen on exams that people will kind of mix them. So, so they'll do SE sum divided by the square root of the number of draws, or they'll do the SD of the box divided by the number of draws. So make sure you're going to, you know, decide which one you're going to use and, and, and just be consistent. Um, the only reason I'm really showing that, you that formula, well, two reasons. One is that it is a little bit quicker if you feel like um, avoiding the, the intermediate step of calculating SE sum. Like I say, you can just jump from SD box, divide by the square root of the number of draws, and you've got your SD average. Um, really, the, my motivation for showing you is not to avoid that step, but to just look at what's going on here as you increase the number of draws. So as you increase the number of draws, SE sum gets bigger, right? It gets bigger according to the square root of the number of draws, right, times the SD of the box. Um, and as the average gets smaller. So what's that telling, what that's telling us in terms of the law of averages um, is that the, as you increase the number of draws, the average of the draws should get closer and closer to the average of the box, right? We expect to get around the average of the box, but we're going to be off by some chance error. In this case, we're thinking about chance error in terms of the average. Um, and like I say, you know, as, as you increase the number of draws, this SE gets smaller, which is telling us that we should expect to get closer and closer to the, the, the average of the box, which is the expected value. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, the law of averages, when we first did it, we were just talking about sums of draws and the percentage of ones. Uh, but the law of averages also, also applies to averages in, the, in that way. Okay? Any questions about that part? Yeah. Is the formula for SE average the same as SE percent? It's close. Um, the formula for SE percent is this times 100 percent, right? So, so if you want to think about why that is, if you take a percent, what you're doing is you're really taking, like if you have, um, I don't know, 10 coin tosses and you get three heads, what percentage heads do you get? You get 30 percent. How do you calculate that? Well, what you do is you, you Take 3 divided by 10 times 100%. All right, no, let's write that down. So uh, just, just a little aside. So you have 3 heads and 10 coin tosses. Expressed as a percent, we take the number of heads, divide by the number of draws, times 100%. Well, the box here is this, right? Zero, one, and take 10 draws. Three out of 10 is the average of those draws. If you, if you get three heads in 10, draw, in 10 coin tosses, and you think about it with this box model, what are the actual draws? The draws are three ones and seven zeros. So if you add them all up and divide by how many there are, you get three tenths. Right? Add them all up, you get three. Divide by ten, you get three tenths. So this is the average, actually. This is the average of the draws from that box to get three out of ten. Um, if I, you know, if I sort of actually get my observed value, I actually get three heads. Um, this is the percent. So it sort of makes sense that if you think about the standard error, well, the standard error for the average, um, well, the standard error for the percent is. SE average times 100%, just like the actual average, or sorry, the actual percent is the average times 100%. Okay, so it sort of mirrors the, the, what you're actually doing, the formula you're actually using. Um, and similarly, the, the average of this box is 0.5, right? Well, what's the percentage of ones in the box? It's 50%. How do you get from the percentage of one? How do you get to the percentage of ones from the average of the box? Multiply by 100%. So the percentage of ones in general is 
the average, the average time is 100% if you're just dealing with zeros and ones. So yeah, in any formulas you want to deal with having to do with percents, you can deal with averages and then multiply by 100%. Um, the, av you know, the average is more general. The, the formula for the average refers to any box, whereas if you're dealing with percentages, you're just talking about a box with zeros and ones. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. So, I'll do a quick um, example. And then I'll get to kind of actually new material. Um, roll fair die, I should say, fair die 100 times. What is the chance that the average of the rolls is more than 3.67? Okay, so. I'm going to do some kind of normal approximation here, and it's basically going to follow the same pattern as normal approximation I've done before. I want to find expected value. I want to find standard error. I want to convert this into standard units by subtracting the expected value divided by standard error, um, and then I'll get my answer. So in order to do this, I need to get a box model for this situation. So for a die roll, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, six, sorry. At least six sides. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, 100 die rolls. Um, these are with replacement, sort of obviously, I hope. Um, and the average of the box is, is 3.5. I mean, you could, if you want, you can just calculate it. It's the average of these numbers, add them up, divide by how many there are. Or you might just think about it as being symmetrical around 3.5. So it sort of balances at 3.5. Uh, and then the SD, I won't calculate. It's, it's just the, you know, you just calculate the SD of this list of numbers. So it's basically a chapter four thing, I guess. Um, the SD comes out to be about 1.7. All right. <coughs> so now what I'm interested in, if you're, if you're, gonna, if you're taking notes, um, leave a little room. So I'm going to draw here in a second. Um, what I'm interested in is basically the area to the right of this. And the reason why I'm pausing before I draw anything here is uh, I would like to think about whether or not this follows the normal curve. Um, what do you think should be true in order for the normal curve to make sense here? Any guesses? Thoughts? What, what, what sort of justifies doing normal approximation? Yeah. If you'd like to have a large number of die rolls, how many? Yeah. More than 25 is, is sort of my rule of thumb that I gave you. The more, the better. The, the more rolls you have, the more closely the probability histogram will look like the normal curve. So that's a chapter 18 idea. Now, I, I've described that idea with sums of draws um, in, in, in some detail in chapter 18. But if you think about what's going on here, um, the average you can calculate by taking the sum divided by the number of draws. So there's this, there's this close relationship between the average and the sum. And it's, you can think about that r relationship in this way. If the average is 3.5, what is the sum? <coughs> can, you, can you tell? It's got to be 350, right? I have 100 die rolls, and the average is the sum divided by 100. So if, if the average is 3.5, the sum has to be 350, and vice versa. And similarly, here's 367. So y y if the probability histogram for the sum of draws follows the normal curve, well, then the probability histogram for the average of the draws has to follow the normal curve. It's, it's sort of the same hi probability histogram. Right? Um, each each possible value of the average here 
corresponds to a particular value of the sum address. So this should look like the normal curve. And like I said, the reason is basically the same reason as for the sum of draws, which is, first of all, that there are at least 25 draws. And what's the second thing? Yeah, good. Expected value plus or minus two SEs should be in the range of possible values. Well, um, I haven't calculated that yet. So I, I need to check that, but I will. Okay, so it, it ends up working. All right, so let's calculate that. So we know the um, ex expected value for the average of the draws is equal to the average of the box, 3.5. Okay, so that's why this is in the center. The SE for the sum of draws, I'll do that first. That's square root of the number of draws times the SD of the box, which is 17. And SE average is SE sum divided by the number of draws, which is 0.17. So expected value is 2.5, SE average is, is 0.17. So if I go two SEs either way from the expected value, um, I'm well within the range of possible values. The range of possible values here would be anything from one to six, right? If I, if I rolled one every single time, the average of the rolls would be one. If I rolled six every single time, the average of the rolls would be six. So that range of one to six gives me the range of possible values. Like I said, Two at plus or minus two SEs is well within that, okay? So normal curve should work well, normal approximation should work well, and so what I'm doing is this. I'm trying to find that area. So I need to convert into standard units. And the center is zero, zero SEs away from the expected value. And then this, you can maybe see, I, I did this so the numbers would come out nicely. Um, 3.67 is the, is the value minus the expected value divided by the standard error of 0.17. So that's one. Okay, so I know that there's about 68% in the middle. And then this is 100 minus 68 divided by two is about 16%. About 16%. Okay, any questions, thoughts? Okay, so um, that's basically kind of the, the chapter 23 equivalent of chapter 18. And chapter 23 um, kind of hits a lot of the ideas in previous chapters, but rather than talking about sums or percents, it's talking about averages. So this is, a, this is sort of like the, the, like I say, the chapter 23 version of, ch of chapter 18, doing normal approximation with averages. Um, we also have, I guess this is sort of the, the chapter 23 version of chapter 17, calculating the expected value in standard error. Those are formulas that we first saw in chapter 17. So that's like chapter 17, this is like chapter 18. Um, chapter 19, this is sort of its own thing. Um, and chapter 20 has to do with percents except for one little bit, which is the correction factor. So I'll, I'll mention the correction factor here. Um, you notice I didn't use it. Why not? Anyone know why I wouldn't use the correction factor here? Yeah. I'm sorry. I said correction factor, but it's not what I meant. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. You were not, we're not using the correction factor um, because it's with replacement. So that's, that's one thing. I was actually thinking about the, um, the continuity correction, sorry. Why, why am I not using the continuity correction here? But that's, that's absolutely right. The correction factor, chapter 20, we're not doing it because it's with replacement. What about the continuity correction? Why am I not using that? There's a little bit of a murmur. Anyone wanna say what they're thinking? Yeah. Well, it's not percents, but that's the right idea. Because it's continuous, right? It's continuous. Um, averages can be decimal values. So the first thing you check when you think about using the continuity correction is, um, is it a discrete probability histogram? And it's not. Uh, it's, a, it's a continuous probability histogram because you can get decimal values. So no continuity correction with averages. 
since averages are continuous. Okay. Um, yeah, question? Okay, so what if I asked, what's the chance that average is exactly 3.5? So first of all, I won't do that to you, but it's a good point, and I was gonna mention that um, it might bother you that if I draw this axis for the sums of draws, 350 is a possible value, 351 is a possible value, 352, and so forth. This is discrete. The sum of a bunch of die rolls is discrete, and that would give you a discrete probability histogram, yet I'm claiming that with averages you have a continuous histogram, yet I'm claiming that it's the same probability histogram, okay? So that might bother you, that it's sort of a little bit inconsistent there. Um, so it's true that, in fact, it's possible to get exactly 350. That would correspond to getting exactly 3.5 here. If I got 351 here, that would correspond to getting exactly 3.51 here, 3.52, 3.53, up to 3.67, and so forth, okay? So in a sense, with 100 die rolls, every 100th is possible. So, you know, you could think about this as, how, as, as, as a probability histogram with a bar centered at every 100th of a number. I won't make you do that, okay? So I'll, I'll, never, I'll never make you think about that issue, so you can ignore it now. If you're dealing with averages, don't use the continuity correction, all right? Um, it's, in this case, I think relatively easy to see that, that relationship. 3.5 corresponds to 350. 3.51 would correspond to 351. But suppose I had like 93 draws from the box, then it's quite difficult to think about what are actually the possible values of the average and where would the edges of those bars be, okay? So for that reason, I'm sweeping it under the rug a little bit and just saying, don't use the continuity correction with averages since averages are continuous. But you're correct, at the, at the, at the core, um, it is technically possible to get an average of exactly 3.5. And the way, you know, if you, if I, if I, I wouldn't ask you to do it, but if I did, the way you might think about doing it is, well, in order for that to happen, you need to have the sum of draws be 350 and then approach it as a sum of draws problem. But like I said, I won't, I won't make you do that. Okay, good, any other questions? Okay, so that sort of gets us through talking about, you know, sort of chapter 17, 18, and I guess a little bit of 20, uh, as those things correspond to chapter 23. Um, so the last part of chapter 23 deals with confidence intervals. It's kind of an ex extension of chapter 21, but rather than talking about percents, we're talking about averages. So, um, Confidence intervals with averages are very much the same as confidence intervals with percents. There are a few little differences that come about because uh, averages are a, little bit, are a little bit more general. As I said before, with percents, you're always dealing with a zero, one box. With averages, your box could sort of be anything, okay? So because of that, it's maybe a little bit more complicated to deal with, with averages. Um, the end of last lecture, I finished up chapter 21 by talking about some kind of rules or guidelines for when confidence intervals make sense. Uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna briefly say those again. Um, sort of issues or rules. The first one is that normal approximation has to make sense. And so you, make, you basically want to check two things. Check first at least 25 draws. And second, that the statistic, which is all you know, right? The statistic is the sample value. That statistic, plus or minus two SEs, is in range of possible values. Um, 
second thing, oh, the second thing is that you shouldn't have any bias. So I'll say no bias or maybe negligible bias. There are examples, negligible. Um, there are examples that I'll do and are done in the book sometimes where it's the Gallup poll or something similar and um, we'll make a confidence interval even though we know that there probably is a little bit of bias for a variety of reasons. Okay, so I've talked about Gallup poll in some detail. Um, it's, it's not, you know, sort of not technically by the book right in the sense that, honestly, I'm not really 95% confident that the parameter is in this interval because I think it's probably a little bit biased, so it's not quite right, right? Um, but nevertheless, we'll talk about it. And the way that we usually talk about it to, to um, be a little bit more honest is to, is to think about um, the chance error as one part and the bias separately. If you, if you look online at what like the Gallup poll or the field poll says about their surveys, they'll say, you know, we can say with 95% confidence that the parameter is within this interval. However, there are kind of practical difficulties and you know this and that having to do with conducting public opinion polls, which might affect the results. So they have a you know they do sort of mention it on the side, but basically their confidence statement follows this idea that they don't really think there's much bias. Okay? So you know do everything they do everything they can to try to eliminate or minimize bias, and then they kind of pretend that it's not really there so much. Okay. Um, so along the lines here, maybe I'll just say, um, if you have a simple random sample or a sample that's like just like draws from a box with replacement, so simple random samples without replacement, if you have without replacement or with replacement, as long as it looks just like draws from a box, um, that's going to eliminate any selection bias, okay? There's no systematic reason why your estimate should be too high or too low if you do that. Uh, if you do some other kind of sample, might be biased, might have selection bias. Uh, Non-response bias and response bias, you can't control by your sampling procedure. Non-response bias, well, you know, just because you conduct your sample in a, in a, in a good way, um, you can't force people to answer your questions. So there might be some people that don't answer your questions and, you know, you can't, you can't as, a, as a pollster, you can't do anything about that. Um, so even if you do a simple random sample, there might be non-response bias, there might also be response bias, depending on how you word your question and that kind of thing. Again, uh, the field poll and the Gallup poll, I think, do a pretty good job of having their questions worded in a neutral way. They randomize the order of candidates, um, and they, I think they're pretty careful to word things neutrally. Okay, so that's that point. Um, let's see, I kind of want to squeeze in here without using another board, these last two things. I, was, I think I'm just gonna write them up here. Sorry if that's a little bit confusing for note taking, but I wanna start fresh over there. So third thing is um, using confidence statements versus chance statements. So I said before, like saying something like, there's a 95% chance that the parameter is inside this confidence interval. That's wrong, right? You, you can't, you can't, use the word chance there because chance applies to things that, like die rolls and coin tosses that are sometimes some one value, you roll the die again, you get another value. The parameter's not like that. The parameter is the percentage of ones in the box or in, in chapter 23, it's the average of the box. It's some number. It's either in a given interval or it's not. It's not sometimes in that interval. The parameter doesn't change. So it's, it's either gonna be inside a given confidence interval or it's not. Whereas, like a die roll, sometimes you get a one, sometimes you get a four, whatever. You get, you get different values every time you roll it. Um, okay, so this is confidence versus chance. I'll just do it, sort of abbreviate it. Um, again, make confidence statements about parameters, like I'm 95% confident that the parameter is in this confidence interval. Don't, don't use chance. Chance is appropriate for sample values. So something like this. What's the chance that the average of the rolls, that's the, the average of the rolls is the sample average, right? It's the average of the draws. 
that's a random thing. If I roll 100 draws, or sorry, roll 100 dice again, I'd get a different average value. So chance is appropriate there. Um, okay, so that's that's that. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to just I mentioned before, and I'll mention again. Uh, around this time in the class, I find that people start like making mistakes about using um, the average in the SD instead of the expected value in the standard error, or they use the wrong expected value, the wrong standard error. There's a little bit of confusion about that. So I just want to remind you, average and SD are for data or list of numbers Uh, we calculate them for tickets in the box, right, the average of the box, the SD of the box. Um, all these things are fairly c concrete, that the average is what you get if you add them all up and divide by how many there are. Okay, so you ought to be able to somehow do it. I, I mean, you may not know, you may not be given the numbers, but in theory at least, if you were given the numbers, you could calculate the average in the SD uh, for any of these things, but a, a data set, a list of numbers, tickets in a box. Expected value and standard error, so there, there are three of them now, right? Expected value and standard error for sums of draws, for percentage of ones, and for averages. So keep those three things straight. You know, what, what are you dealing with? Think about what you're dealing with and, and which expected value and which SE you need. Um, in general, expected values and, and standard errors tell you something about chance error. Expected value uh, tells you um, what you expect to get, standard error tells you the likely size of the chance error. So somehow there so, has to be some random thing going on. <clears throat> um, I mean, I'll just say random things. What I mean here is sums of draws from a box, percentage of ones in a sample, like sample percent or sample average. So somehow. Uh, this should be in the draws. Okay. So again, the expected value tells you the what you expect to get for some random thing, and the standard error tells you the likely size of the chance error. Um, these are a little bit, or th this situation is a little bit more abstract. I can tell you that in 100 coin tosses, I expect to get 50 heads without tossing any coins, right? And I can tell you the standard error turns out to be five without tossing any coins. Um, if you're calculating the average in the SD, somehow you need something a little bit more concrete. You, you can't just, you know, do it based on a calculation like that. Okay. So questions on that part? Okay. Um, let's see. I guess... Uh, I guess it's a little bit early, but I guess I'll take a little break. The, the example I want to do is kind of long. And if I do it without a break, you might stop being awake or something. Okay. So let's take a little quick break, and I'll, I'll do an example, chapter 23 example.
OK. So um, confidence interval stuff, basically the same issues as in chapter 21. But like I said, there's a little bit, uh, little bit of a difference for chapter 23. So what I want to do now is I want to do a confidence interval in terms of averages. And that'll kind of get me through, um, through the end of chapter 23. And then I will, we're skipping chapter 24, we're skipping chapter 25. I'll do a little bit of chapter 26, at least to, I don't know, give you a preview of what, what chapter 26 is all about. OK, so um, suppose that I have a simple random sample of 400 Cal students. And the average math SAT score in the sample is 563. And the sample SD is 90. And first thing I want to do is, um, is say this sort of say it in a, in a kind of general way. The book often words things this way. The average MSAT score for all Cal students is around blank, give or take, blank. So. In English, what should go in that first blank? If I, if I, if I wanted to put in, in, a, a word in here rather than number, what word would I put there? Anyone want to say? Average of the sample? Okay. Anyone agree, disagree? Yeah? Average of the population? Anyone else? Any other suggestions? Okay, good. So it's it's not expected value. Okay? Expected value. Um, wouldn't make sense here because I don't really know what is in the box, right? When you think about expected values for averages, this is, this is an average. Expected value for an average should be the average of the box. I don't know the average of the box. So it's not really um, reasonable to think about this as, as an expected value. Um, so the, the, actually the word I was thinking of is statistic. Statistic is the same as average of the sample, right? Um, Average of the population is what this actually is. It's not around. It actually is the same thing. The average of the average MSAT, MSAT score for all Cal students is the average of the sample, the average of the box. It's around the average of the sample, or you could say statistic. Either one of those would be fine here. Okay. Give or take what in English? Anyone? This one's easier, I think. Yeah? Standard error for average, OK? So this is the, um, so here you could say either statistic or sample average. And here it's the SE for this thing, right? This tells you the likely size of the chance error in your estimate or your guess, your statistic, your sample average. So I just want to kind of emphasize what's, what's going on here. I think there's a tendency to just say, OK, well, that's 563, and not really think about it any further, like what, what, what's going on here. Um, we, our, we believe that the average MSAT score for all Cal students should be around the sample average, which is, like I say, it's the statistic, um, give or take. SE average. And I also want to kind of emphasize that this SE 
is connected to this. This is a random number, right? It's a sample average. If I took a different sample, I might get something else. Just like if I roll a die, get one thing, I'll roll it again, get another thing. Random. Um, the parameter is not random. I don't know what it is, but it's some number. If I, if I actually knew what all Cal students got on their MSAT scores, I could calculate the average and it wouldn't change, right? It's not, it's not like sometimes, sometimes you got this and sometimes you got that. You got a score, everyone else got a score. You can literally calculate the average score. Um, okay. So, well, I, you know, I guess if you took it more than once, you would get different scores, but like there's a score, like if someone asked you what did you get on the MSAT, you would tell them the best you did, I guess. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's sort of one number corresponding to each person. Okay, um, so yeah, again, this, is, this SE corresponds to whatever that is. So let's do that calculation really quick. And I'll draw, I'll draw the box model and kind of um, make clear exactly what's going on. Um, who's in the box? All Cal students, right? Uh, what numbers go on the tickets? MSAT scores, right? So for each person, there's an MSAT score. So like every person has their own ticket, and then I get 400 of those. And it's a simple random sample, so it's without replacement. And, um, uh, yeah, so I need to get SE average, so SD. Okay, maybe back, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk for a little bit more, a minute more. Um, so I erased it, but the SE average formula is the standard error for the sum of draws divided by the number of draws. And what's the standard error for the sum of draws? What's the formula for that? SE sum is equal to square root of the number of draws times SD of the box. Do I know those things? So I, I know the number of draws, right? It's 400. Do I know the SD of the box? No. Should I give up? <laughs> I heard you. Yeah. Um, so someone said yes, if you didn't hear in the back. Um, I'm not going to give up. Darn it. Um, so what can I do? I'm going to use the SD of the sample to estimate the SD of the box. So this, this is called the bootstrap method. Um, so I just want to um, sort of emphasize that I'm doing it, that um, the formula tells me I should use the SD of the box. I don't know it, but the SD of the sample hopefully is close. And I mentioned before, the bootstrap method in general works quite well. Um, even, even in general, even if the, uh, the 563 is off by a fair amount, generally the, the SD of the sample is a pretty good estimate of the SD of the box, and we're not going to go into it in any more depth than that, but generally that's true. Um, and, you know, we don't have really cho any choice anyway. Um, the, I don't think I mentioned the, the idea of the bootstrap method is that, oh, I don't have any, um, uh, a bootstrap is a strap on a boot. And um, it, the, the reason why it's called this is a little bit obscure and maybe a little bit silly. It's, so the purpose of a, of a bootstrap is there's a strap on the back of your boot. A lot of uh, like sneakers have them, like a little tiny, I kind of think of it as a vestigial bootstrap. It's like a little thing there and maybe you could use it to pull on your shoe, but probably not very functional anymore. Um, but that, that's the idea, uh, is, that, is that you have a little loop there, you can pull on your shoe. Um, if you have one. So the, the, the saying about bootstraps is that is there's a say, saying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which kind of roughly means that, um, like what it literally means is that if you just have a situation where you have no, no other way to get out of it, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and like, you know, you can get out of any bad situation. And obviously it's sort of physically impossible. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, the, that's the saying, and that's the idea is that uh, it's like, if times are tough, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, and that's sort of the idea here, which is sort of 
silly, like I say. It's, it's just we don't have any other choice. We don't have any other way to get an SD. We're not going to give up. We're going to use the bootstrap method. OK. So bootstrap estimate of SD of box equals 90. All right. So then um, I can calculate SD sum, square root of the number of draws times 90. That's 1,800. And then finally, SE average is equal to 1,800. SE sum divided by number of draws. That comes out to be 4.5. OK? So filling in my blank here. The average MSAT score for all Cal students is around 563, give or take 4.5. And um, I don't know if that's surprising or not, just how accurate that is. I don't know. 400 students get a pretty good, pretty accurate estimate of the average of the box with a sample like that. Um, OK. So any questions about that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, she asked, what about the correction factor? Well, how many Cal students do you think there are? More than 4,000, right? So, so the sample size is less than 10% of the population size, so I'm going to ignore it. But thank you for bringing it up. I should mention that I am actually um, ignoring it. I, I think there are something like 24,000 Cal undergrads, something like that. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I'm not really, be, I'm being a little bit sloppy here. I should probably specify if I mean just undergrads or everybody. I guess I'm thinking of just undergrads. So we're at about 24,000. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's, let's do a confidence interval. Um, so 95% confidence interval for the parameter, which is the average of, the, of all Cal students. Average MSAT of all Cal students. Is 563 plus or minus two standard errors. Or I'm going to actually figure out what those numbers are. 563 minus 9 is 554. 2, 572. Okay. Okay, so my original description of a confidence interval is, is basically this gives you a range which is likely to contain the parameter. I, I think that, you know, the parameter is probably in there. I, I want to avoid using the word chance there, but that's kind of intuitively the way I think of it, is that, is that I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident that the parameter is in there, and to say it a little bit more technically, I would say I'm 95% confident that the parameter is between 554 and 572, parameter being average MSAT score of all Cal students. Okay? Um, yeah, so that's sort of roughly what, how I would think about interpreting that interval. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a bunch of, um, True or false questions. Some of them are easier than others. Um, on each one, I'm going to ask everyone to vote. And, you know, some of you will get it right, some of you will get it wrong. It's okay. And I, actually, I, I want to say, you know, there's a tendency to have a high non response rate for questions like this that I ask in class. Um, I just want to encourage you to vote. Um, not so much because I care about the response rate, but because I think it's, it's good for you, that you learn more if you get things wrong, right? So if, if you actually vote and have your beliefs confirmed and like ingrained in your head, or if you're like, whoa, I thought it would be the other way, that both those experiences I think are good for, for learning, okay? So I'm, I'm not gonna really, you know, no one's really paying attention to whether or not you got it right. Um, Okay, so true or false? About 68% of the students, oh shoot, I have to tell you something else. Yeah. 
sorry. This, this sort of um, ruins the surprise a little bit. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, but I want to tell you this. So MAT scores follow the normal curve. So pretend I had that on the board the whole time. Okay. And I, I mean either in the sample or in the population. I don't really care. Just presume like any time you look at a histogram of MSAT scores, it looks like the normal curve. Okay. Um, so about 68% of the students in the sample Actually, it doesn't, it doesn't spoil it. It just prevents you from making one kind of mistake, I guess. About 68% of the students in the sample um, have MSAT scores between 473 and 653. Okay, and this 473, this is 563 minus 90, and this is 563 plus 90. Um, so for these questions, I'm not gonna give you a ton of time to think about it, because I sort of would rather that more of you miss it. Um, so you sort of learn whether or not your gut instinct, intuitive thought is correct or not. Okay, so true or false, who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's false? Okay, so pretty mixed. Uh, maybe a few more people think it's true. Anyone want to speak in favor of either true or false? Say what you're thinking. That's pretty common, incidentally. I've, you know, I've asked this question or one like it before. And seems like pretty often it's fairly evenly divided. Yeah. Okay, so I'll summarize briefly what he said. Um, I'll just tell you, it's, he's right, it's true, okay? Um, and it's, it's for the reason he said, I'll just say it a little bit more quickly, which is that um, we have a list of numbers, a bunch of MSAT scores for the people in the sample. There are 400 numbers in our list. What do I know about these numbers? I know their average, right? Their average is 563. I know their SD, it's 90, and I know they follow the normal curve. So based just on that information, chapter five, we could answer this question, okay? You know, just, think, just think, like I said, just think about this list of 400 numbers, they follow the normal curve, we know the average, we know the SD, we can do chapter five stuff, which tells us that about 68% of them are within one SD of the average, okay? So this is true. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, won't, I won't write out what I said. You know, basically, you know the average, you know the SD, you know they follow the normal curve, so you're all good. You can use the normal table to figure out that 68% are within one SD of the average. Okay, um, I think why people get confused here um, is be, well, one reason why people get confused is because we are uh, so far away from that chapter, and you sort of think maybe this has to do with averages or with you know, something in chapter 23, and it really doesn't, okay? So I just wanna remind you, this kind of thing is still true. All right. So let's try this one. So I guess I'll number these. This is one, two, about 68% of MSAT scores, I'm oh, sorry, I'll say of all MSAT scores, all MSAT scores. I, I'm, I'm sorry, no, I'll say it the way I was gonna say it to be honest, it makes more sense. MSAT scores of all Cal students. Okay, about 68% of the MSAT scores of all Cal students are between Um, what numbers do I want in here? Uh, 
558.5 and 567.5. So 558.5 is 563 minus 4.5. 5, 567.5 is 563 plus 4.5. Okay? So, who says true? Who says false? Okay. So, you're almost all right. This is false. Okay? Um, so, what I'd like to ask you <coughs> is, without, without saying why, quite yet. Um, are there any numbers that I could put here, leaving the rest of the sentence the same, are there any numbers that I could put here to make this sentence true? How many people think there are numbers that I could put there to make it true? How many people think there aren't numbers that I could put there? Okay, so that's a pretty low response rate. Um, <laughs> so there are a, couple, a few people on either side. Um, so if you think there are numbers that I could put there, what numbers? Anyone that said yes want to say what I would put there? Yeah. So it's just suggesting I could put these numbers there and that would make it true. Um, so, uh, a few of you had a, had a problem with that, presumably. Those are sort of the obvious choices, I think. Anyone think that's false? And want to say why? Yeah. Those numbers are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring bootstrap into it, but that's right. They're, those are estimates of what? Of the box, right? Okay, so. I actually think the answer to this is that it's true, but that I don't know what those numbers are is the way that I would answer the question, which is maybe a little bit unfair. The way that I would answer this question is that the number I'd like to put here is the population average minus the population SD. And I don't know what those things are. I have estimates of them. You know, these are my estimates, right? 563 and, and, and 90. So I would like to put population average, so there, to make true. I want population average minus population SD. Oops, population SD. And then population average plus population SD. And I don't know either one of those, okay? So that's, that's <coughs> sort of why I would say it's false, is that um, that's what you want. This is, using, using the standard error is pretty wrong, which I think most of you saw. Um, the, the standard error has to do with the chance error for the sample average. And I'm not actually talking about averages here. I'm talking about the actual MSAT scores. So there's something like 24,000 numbers, 24,000 actual MSAT scores, and it's those scores that I'm interested in. Uh, you know, like I say, I don't, I don't know the average of that list of numbers. I don't know the SD of those, that list of numbers. I have estimates for them, but I don't really know what they are. So, you know, Putting 563 minus 90 and 563 plus 90 here is not crazy, you know? About 68% of the, of the values are probably in that range, but, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of centered at a value that's probably not quite right, and the spread is probably not quite right. So, like I say, it's not, it's not going to be wildly, it's not going to be like, you know, if, if I plugged in those numbers, it's not going to be 90% of the numbers between, between those two values. It's not going to be 20% of the numbers, but it's not going to be that close to this. It's probably off by a, a little bit. Yeah? Right, so he, he's suggesting we could say something like, we're 95% confident that about 68% of the MSAT scores of all Cal students are between this and this. That's not, um, that's not quite right. Well, 
Yeah, you, you can't quite make a confident statement about the scores themselves, right? You can make a confident statement about the average of all the scores, is really what we do. Make a confident statement for the parameter itself, okay? So, you know, it's, it's that, right? I'm 95% confident that the average MSAT score of all Cal students is in that range, right? Okay, good, any other questions, thoughts? Okay, let's do another one. Okay, so, okay. So I'm gonna make you answer this one fast. Just so you know, you're warned. 68% confidence interval for the average MSAT score in the sample is that range there, 558.5 to 567.5. Again, that's 563 minus 4.5, 563 plus 4.5. Okay, who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's false? Okay, I mean it. Answer, just answer something, I don't really care. But I think you should try to answer it, okay? Okay, true. False. Okay, better. About, about half and half, I think. Okay, so I wanted you to, to answer this one in particular quickly because uh, I think if you think about it long enough, you'll see why it's false. So it's false. Why is it false? Yeah. Yeah. The average MSAT score in the sample is 563. It's definitely in that interval, okay? You don't need a confidence interval for something you know, and in general, confidence intervals are for parameters, they're not for statistics. So average MSAT score in the sample, that's a statistic, it's not a parameter. So there's, you know, in general, there's no reason to make a confidence interval for that, and, and for this problem in specific, you actually know it, right? You actually know the average score in the sample, so it's just in there. Um, you would never do, do a confidence interval or make a confidence state statement about a statistic anyway, because you can make a chance statement, right? You can, you can, if you actually um, had, had the, con if you knew the contents of the box, you could um, make your box model, find the actual expected value and the actual standard error, and figure out the probability that the sample average would be in a range or something like that, okay? If you didn't know it. We actually do know it in this case, so it's sort of um, doubly um, false, okay? It's, it's definitely in that range. Okay. Uh, so this is false. And if you want to make it true, all you need to do is change that word to population. Okay, one more. Uh, I guess I will erase this. So for the confidence interval I made at the beginning, meaning this one up here, a 95% confidence interval for the average MSAT of all Cal students, okay? For that confidence interval, um, it doesn't matter if, I'm uh, sorry, whether, it doesn't matter whether, slightly more correct English, it doesn't matter whether the MSAT scores 
follows a normal curve. The confidence interval I made at the beginning, that confidence interval up there, it doesn't matter whether the MSAT scores follow the normal curve. So who says that's true? Okay, who says that's false? Okay. This is my favorite. Because it's it looks so false, but it's true. Okay. Um, why is this true? A few people said that was true. Yeah? As long as the sample average follows the normal curve. So, so what, what you need to have follow the normal curve is not the MSAT scores themselves, it's the probability histogram for the sample average, right? And you think about that, the, the die roll problem I did at the beginning, sort of at the beginning of class where I use the normal curve. If you think about the contents of the box, one, two, three, four, five, six, if you drew a histogram for those points, one, two, three, four, five, six, they don't follow the normal curve, right? It's not, not important whether or not those, those values follow the normal curve. What's important is that your number of draws is large enough so the probability histogram follows the normal curve, right? In this case, the probability histogram we're talking about is the probability histogram for the sample average. So what we need to check is at least 25 draws and check Statistic plus or minus two standard errors, which actually is that range, right? Statistic plus or minus two standard errors is that confidence interval. And that range, 554 to 572, is well within the range of possible values. I have at least 25 draws. So that's a pretty good indication that the probability histogram for the, um, for the sample average will follow the normal curve, <laughs> even if the original contents of the box don't, even if the, the sample values don't. It's not so important. What's important is, that, again, the probability histogram for the sample um, average follows the normal curve. Um, so there's a picture of this in your book. Uh, I should, probably should have written down the page. It's, I think it's like 419, maybe? It's, it's in chapter 23, and it shows three different pictures. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem with a sample for educational levels in the town. And uh, it shows the town. It shows the contents of the box. Ordinarily, they wouldn't know it, but, but you know, it's a, it's a made-up problem, so it, it, the, you can pretend that the contents of the box are actually known, and educational levels typically don't follow the normal curve. You have, like, big spikes at 12 years of education, at 16 years of education, a few people in between, a few people more, a few people less, okay? But you ha you, it's, it doesn't look like a nice normal curve, all right? And if you look at the sample values, same thing. Spike at 12, spike at 16, not so much like the normal curve. But if you look at the probability histogram for the average of the sample values, um, I'm sorry, the, the probability histogram for the sample average, that will look like a normal curve. And, and that, that picture is shown in the book where you have these like two weird looking histograms and then having enough draws, everything turns out okay. Everything, everything looks like the normal curve in the end, okay? So it doesn't matter, this is true, it doesn't matter whether or not the original box looks like the normal curve or that the sample values look like the normal curve. What's important is the probability histogram for the sample average does. So again, those checks, 25 draws and statistic plus or minus two SEs. Okay, any questions? You mean in terms of making this check, or you mean just in general? I, I'll repeat what he said in a second, but. Okay, so, so basically you're, you're questioning how accurate the bootstrap method is, I think, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to, not as a value judgment, but, but um, he's basically saying, you know, we have this pretty good idea of how accurate our estimate of the Right? How accurate is our estimate of the average of the box? Well, this describes the accuracy of our estimate. 
give or take about 4.5. We don't have a good idea of how accurate this is as an estimate of the SD of the box. That's true. In a more advanced DAC class, we would look at that, okay? For this class, I'm just telling you, trust me, it's pretty accurate, okay? And it, you know, it's, it is a little bit of a secondary concern. If, if our estimate of the SD is a little bit off, it means that that confidence interval maybe is a little bit too big or a little bit too small. But, you know, it's all a little bit rough anyway. You know, we're sort of saying that's, that range is likely to contain our parameter. And it's true, that range is likely to contain our parameter, 95% confident, you know, roughly, okay? So th there is a little bit of approximation here, and um, yeah, it's, it's not, what you would ideally want to use is the population SD to do all that calculation. Actually, that brings up a point which I, I guess I'm not going to get to chapter 26, but I, I will make one last point about um, these chapters. I think I, I, I drew this picture last time, but I think I didn't say one thing I wanted to say about this. Remember this. This is the, I sort of view this as being an invisible stick. I'm drawing it, but in reality it's invisible. And also, in reality, we would only get to do one, we would only get to take one sample and make one confidence interval. Okay? But I'm sort of hypothetically imagining that I do a bunch of samples, I make a bunch of confidence intervals, so most of them hit or, or cover this invisible stick, occasionally we'll get one that misses. So my additional comment I want to make about this is, are these confidence intervals all the same length? Are they all the same length? No. Why not? So they're all found by taking a statistic, a sample value, and going plus or minus two standard errors, right? But the problem is that the standard error calculation is a little bit different every time I do it because of this same issue, that we have a sample SD. If I take a different sample, I might get a slightly different sample SD. So when I go plus or minus two SEs, in fact, these intervals are, are in general, going to be all slightly different lengths. Some of them will be a little bit bigger, if the sample SD turned out to be a little bit bigger, some of them will be a little bit smaller if the sample SD turned out to be smaller. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, okay? Um, questions about that? Quick little idea? Okay, so that really is the end of chapter 23. Um, I think that's actually, I'm exactly where the syllabus says I am. I think the syllabus says I should be starting chapter 26 on Thursday, which um, is what I'll do. Okay? Any final questions, thoughts? Okay, bye-bye. See you Thursday.